Welcome back, everybody, to the Growing Band Director podcast. Jeff, I can't believe we're already on episode number 66. Um, super excited to have you here. And to Dr. Doug Owens from Old Dominion University. Um, Doug is a good friend from his time in Maine, and you're going to hear a lot from him and about him. Um, he is currently the F. Ludwig Dean Chair of Music Ed at Old Dominion University, as well as a, the Coordinator of Graduate Music Education. Doug, did I say that right? Yes. Wonderful. Awesome. So a quick story, Doug, I don't know what you have for snow down there. Do you guys have snow right now? You know, we, we might get uh, five, six inches a year. Yeah. Uh, right now, it's uh, about 40 degrees and sunny, and we haven't had a bit of snow all year. It's been cold, cold for us. So um, for, for anybody watching the YouTube video, if you watch our, these on YouTube, I'm wearing different glasses. I'm not trying to look cool, but literally, I snow blew my other glasses. My other glasses fell out oh, of no. my pocket, and then I ran them over with the snowblower, and they are now somewhere in pieces, and I will find them when I'm mowing the lawn in six months. So uh, this is not a fashion statement. It's simply all I own. Uh, Jeff, you and I have similar glasses now. <laughs> yes, we do. So I was leaving band today a couple hours ago, about an hour ago, and the kids were fighting. And they were fighting about a very band student sort of fight. They're, they were fighting. One kid was saying that Sevens by Sam Hazo is better. And another kid was adamant that Slava by Leonard Bernstein is better. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to start with you. What do you think? Well, m my opinion is that if I'm a high school kid, I'm going to pick sevens. But if I'm an advanced high school college kid, I'm going to pick Slava for two di totally different reasons because of the content and the compositional effort that Bernstein put into the Slava. Seventh, just a cool piece for high school kids to play. Doug, what do you think? Yeah, Jeff, Jeff put it the best, I think. Uh, I totally agree. Um, Slava to me has got that, that uh, you know, obviously uh, the Bernstein background and, and, and compositional cues that are that are all throughout. And um, you know, for me, it's 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 classic. Um, it's it's been here. It's it's stood the test of time. And um, not to say the other won't, but um, same perspective. If if I'm in high school, yes, you know. Uh, uh, sevens for sure, but um, long term listenability, playability, Slava for sure. So I don't know if anybody listening knows this, but see, my band is not was not good enough last year to play Slava. However, there is a Robert Longfield edition of Slava that's of the grade four ish, and it's very playable. And besides being a little bit slower, it sounds like the original piece, and it's just magnificent so that's why my kids know it there is a great arrangement out there if people haven't heard it they should definitely do it yeah and if i if, if if i could just you know jump in there too i mean I, I think that's that's the bigger picture is exposing your students to to the music um at whatever level um so if it's if it's if it's an arrangement that uh, uh, closely resembles and you can expose them to it more the better and they're talking about it so that's that's perfect just the mere fact that they're talking about the comparison and arguing about it is accolades to you that they're thinking musically far broader than what some kids would think of course it was our two top clarinet players having the arguments it's not like a you know <laughs> yeah you know how those clarinet players are yeah, they're the best they're the best yes they are um, it, it's always like, all right, we're going to move to this piece. And while the band is moving to that piece, because some kids actually had to move clarinets, let's work on this. So they're just always ready to go. So anyways, let's got on, let's got on to, um, why we have Doug on the, the program here. Um, Doug is an expert on music induced hearing loss and Doug is a musician and band director like all of us. Um, Doug, you've presented at Midwest as well as I'm sure many other places that I, that I'm not going to cite. Um, but today is all about basically a message to band directors. Um, how loud is our ensembles? What are we really dealing with with our ears? What should we be looking for? What, how can we fix it? All the things. So I'm going to turn it over to you so we can get this conversation started. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks for having me, um, you too. I mean, it, it's, it's always a great opportunity to be able to share and, uh, you know, get this word out a little bit. So I'd like to share a little bit about, uh, you know, this topic um, you know, not only the, the issue of 
the challenge of potentially having some hearing loss, but also um, how do we protect ourselves? And it's not to say that everyone experiences hearing loss as, as a band director, as a music educator, but um, you know, we, we work in potentially loud environments and um, this information is, is good to know. A um, little bit about me, um, years ago, I uh, was teaching high school, my last high school job, and I um, had recently changed jobs <clears throat> to a band room that was a little smaller, but, uh, you know, different situation in the school. So I was very excited to, to, to change, and um, I was literally in the middle, middle of a rehearsal, and my <laughs> left ear just shut down, wow. shut down completely. Yeah, and um, a little scary. And I thought, well, I just have a cold, you know, <clears throat> something's going on, go to the doctor, see what's happening. And, uh, you know, I went to my my ENT, they said, you know, you, you may have experienced some hearing loss, what have you been doing? You know, you've been working outside, maybe doing some uh, heavy equipment without earplugs. What's going on? And I said, well, I teach high school band. Um, and then they sent me to an audiologist. The audiologist said, uh, you know, they, you know, did, did some hearing tests. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but basically said, you know, you look like you've been in front of a rock band for a while. Wow. Um, and I said, well, I've been in front of a, a high school band for, you know, at that point about 13 years. And, um, you know, so it, it was at that point where that interest started up for me. <clears throat> Um, that was about two weeks of a left ear that had nearly no hearing and a lot of pain just from the, uh, the literal impact, the sonic impact. Thankfully, that hearing, some of it came back and um, uh, the pain is long gone. But uh, what I learned in the, in, the, in the meantime was that um, my room was loud. Um, this is back in the day when you could buy, when you had a Radio Shack, first of all, you can go to Radio Shack and buy a little sound pressure meter and uh, put it out during rehearsal. And every once in a while, I'd look at it, jot it down, jot down the readings, jot down the readings. They were all 90s, 94, 95 decibels, pretty loud. And, you know, and then over time, I, I figured out that uh, the uh, the room was, was, you know, had a lower ceiling than where I used to teach and it had uh, concrete all around, you know, concrete block. And I had two concert bands. So both of those ensembles had me pretty much against that, that, that front wall. So no absorbing materials, nothing to, to, to pull that sound in, to rein it in. And it was just loud and reflective, highly reflective. So as it turned out, I lost um, I lost about uh, about twenty decibels on my my left side, and you know then I started becoming you know more aware of what could be done, not just for myself but but for the students because as as we all know we've always got those students that live in the band room, um, you know they're they're gonna uh, do their rehearsals they'll come down to practice they'll come down to hang out. Um, whatnot, but and they may be involved in, a, in an ensemble or two, um, and then there are additional activities. So we wanted to be able to protect them as well. Thankfully, the administration, uh, you know, took my measurements and uh, did take action. Um, they did uh, have an acoustician come in and, and treat the room. Uh, we got those those noise levels down to about about eighty eight decibels, which very helpful, you know, with the band playing at the level they were. Um, uh, but there, there are some other factors that are involved. And I, I want to just share uh, some of that um, uh, with everybody. What, uh, what ended up happening was I, um, with that job, I, I ended up leaving that job because I, I, I just thought, well, if I'm, if, if, well, number one, uh, I interviewed for an administrator job. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, I thought, well, okay, I'm not going to really do that. I got the job, but uh, uh, then they said, well, you're going to have to go back to school. And I thought, if I'm going to go back to school, I really want to do that for music. So I went back to get my doctorate and focused on music ed, jazz pedagogy, 
and wrote a dissertation on uh, noise induced hearing loss um, and did some some sound pressure studies. So what this is, you know, just basically an illustration of, of the ear. Um, we all know how this works. The sound comes in, uh, the eardrum vibrates. You've got incus, malleus, and stapes that, that, that uh, uh, vibrate and amplify the sound. And then um, you've got membrane, a basilar membrane that uh, is a base for the hearing structures. And then, you know, there's interior fluid that, that ripples and waves form along this membrane. But this big deal, that lower photo there, are these hair cells uh, in the organ of cor corti uh, that, that sit on top uh, uh, of, of, of this membrane. And literally, you know, thinking of, of, of basically these structures uh, that are floating in, in this space. On top of that are stereocilia, these little bristle-like uh, uh, channels. And, um, you know, we now know that neurochemicals, uh, glutamate and uh, uh, gamma amino butyric acid come in and rush, uh, create an electrical signal that goes to our brain and it becomes what we know as hearing. Hmm. Um, and, and then the auditory nerve, you know, is, is involved in that. Um, what, uh, and this is all, all public information on, on uh, 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 government websites, but um, what happens is over time, the stereocilia, if exposed, if we're exposed to high, high decibel levels over time, or, you know, high decibel levels loud enough to, um, to cause damage instantaneously, even there's a chance that those stereocilia will, will de deteriorate and literally disintegrate. And um, that's problematic because they don't grow back. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where that hearing loss challenge uh, comes in for, uh, for so many. Um, the, the, you know, the, 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 the one, um, the few challenges that, that may come of that is what I'd like to share as well. Um, you know, this particular definition from uh, American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine is just saying, you know, this may develop over, over a long period of time. However, more recent definitions will say that noise-induced hearing loss can happen certainly instantaneously, hmm. um, depending on the level of sound and uh, the impact. And then our own, our own uh, hearing structures too. Um, because again, some people don't have, uh, you know, aren't impacted by this challenge as much as others. So, so what do we do? You know, uh, when I had this issue, I was sent to an audiologist. They, they did the hearing test um, and a detailed test called an audiometric threshold exam. And um, we all hear, uh, you know, at, at varying uh, 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 frequencies, but, but noise-induced hearing, hearing loss can only show up between 4,000 and 6,000 hertz. Um, and uh, what what ends up happening is you might get a, a hearing chart like this. Um, uh, the X, X's are represent the, the left ear. Um, and if you look at 4,000, the 4,000 uh, on the graph there, that's about where noise induced hearing loss starts. And you see that uh, that dip, it, it, it's called the audiometric notch. And that notch is indicative of hearing loss. And so this person or this illustration uh, is demonstrating hearing loss in both the left ear, which is, you know, somewhat moderate to severe, and the right ear um, hearing loss between 20 and 30 decibels at 4,000 hertz, slightly impaired. Yep. Um, yeah, so this is what we strive to avoid, but usually, you know, when you go to that audiologist, they'll, they'll do those, those tests, they'll put the headphones on, you'll hear those slight pitches generated. And after a while you start hearing pitches and thinking you're hearing them and you're pressing a button saying, yes, 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 I hear that. Yes. And they, they, they do the math and come up with, um, 
uh, with with this type of uh, this type of audiogram, uh, you know, for you. So if they if when you hear those results, I guess I would say as band directors. It, would it be, it's sort of my assumption that most of us, if we haven't been really thoughtful of it, probably have some sort of hearing loss from our time in front of bands. Would you say that's it, that that's accurate? I would cautiously, cautiously say that. Um, I, I would probably more accurately say that um, the potential for us to be exposed is, is definitely high. Sure. Um, you know, because we, um, you know, for, for myself, we spend, you know, just thinking back in those days, um, <clears throat> maybe rehearsal before school, I had jazz before school, uh, I had one large ensemble first period, um, I was fortunate, I had small group lessons, but I had those, um, second period, uh, short break um, for planning, and then another large ensemble and then more more lessons and I had one jazz ensemble during the school day so um, and then you might have pep band or marching band after school so um, for for the band director you know being this having this level of nearly constant exposure is yeah. problematic especially when we can have one rehearsal you'll see it in a later slide where we could actually have, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, uh, we could actually have up to a day's worth of hearing exposure um, in one rehearsal, in one hour. Um, so, let me just... And, and obviously, the, obviously, the impact has to do with lots of things besides the volume, also the room that you're in. So the room that I'm in, when it was originally done, behind you is just brick. They were thoughtful. They did treat it. However, they just put those, I don't know if you remember in my room, Doug, there's those thick panels that literally yes. cover the entire back wall, except for the board. So, I mean, it's basically like just muffling everything and it's made it into the deadest room possible. It's a really terrible acoustic room. However, mm -hmm. I guess if it's going to be terrible, I'd probably rather be terrible dead than terrible alive. Cause at least it's better for my hearing. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, it obviously it impairs what you're really hearing. In rehearsal setting compared to your auditorium um uh i know that uh, some companies will come in and and try to try to add some reflective surfaces maybe in the ceiling um you've seen those panels that are adjustable yep um some companies have the, the panels that are triangular or other angled shapes so that they can try to balance the room. I just had but, a, I um, just had a, a, a audiologist, not audiologist, uh, an acoustician, I guess, come in. I'm not going to say his name or company, but he's great. And mm -hmm. my room is so terrible. Not only the shape of it, but everything that's been done to it. He said to alter it now almost wouldn't do anything that you want to do. We'd have to like take out what you have and then redo that. The cheap way was $75,000. <laughs> so, but I, I mean, I'm sure that that's not everywhere and looking at doing something to a room is not always that expensive, but if you think about it, if you have, it's a health hazard, right? That is a really big deal. So, you know, schools want to take care of their teachers and, and all that. So um, it was great to hear that your school would do something. I didn't really ask because to be honest, it's like beyond anything I would think we might do. I am curious though, Jeff, you've taught for a long time. Um, and can you tell us how your band room was for sound? My band room had the uh, those thick uh, fibrous acoustical panels in it. And, and then behind that was brick walls, cement brick walls with very high ceilings. And then the floor was carpeted at first, but then we found this rubberized acoustical flooring covering that would absorb some of the sound. So it was... It was okay, but the room was built for 70 kids. So when you put 200 kids in there, it sort of overbalanced the whole situation. Yeah. And I, I vividly remember, you know, when we'd, we'd have to do our pep rallies at, in the fall and in the basketball season. And as the band would march from the band room to the gym, I'd go to the nurse's office and get big, huge wads of cotton and pack my ears with cotton so that I could at least save something because I, I have I have hearing loss and I have special um uh hearing plugs that I wear when I'm in front of loud sounds to try to dampen it a little bit. But yeah, I and I've got the ring in my right ear all the time. I can hear a an A all the time in my right ear. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and that, that brings up a really, really good point, Jeff, about, um, you know, even with 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 good uh, a room that's treated well, you know, when you build your program, which we all strive to do, um, you know, we, we then are in a situation where you have maybe too many people in the room and um, that, that that can be problematic uh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, Do you find that, did you find that, um, especially with the changes in percussion, now that we've gone to uh, Tendura heads and all that stuff, where we're cranking things up to high B flats and high Ds, that uh, the hearing loss problem within percussionists has exponentially increased? The percussionists that, uh, that, I've, that, I've, that have participated in the studies that we, we've had um, nearly 100% show some sort of hearing loss. The, the challenge is, is, is where, you know, where, what environment is that coming from? And we, we try to do survey, we do do surveys in terms of their own playing, but, but you know, they're playing from uh, various, various uh, uh, ensembles, various areas, who knows, they might even have a practice room, that, practice room that's way too small mm -hmm. for individual practice. But, um, uh, you know, to, to, to have a drum line and not, especially the snares, but to run a drum line without having your students, you know, use earplugs is, uh, is, is challenging and, and potentially dangerous for them. Um, you know, we, we, um, I know our, our percussion instructor is, is very adamant about it. He's, he's always got a pocket full of, of, uh, earplugs, um, you know, for, for the drum line and, you know, they, they use them. Uh, even at my last high school, the physics teacher and I um, were, were always in discussion about this. And um, at, at pep rallies, he would stand at the door and pass out earplugs to everyone. <laughs> uh, you know, very smart. He was, he was yeah. very much in tune to that. Okay. Yeah. So what's next? Yeah, um, so thinking about uh, just some of the challenges that exist, you know, uh, <clears throat> two things might happen. If we have a hearing loss, we hope it's temporary, first of all. Um, and that's the, the, the TTS, the temporary threshold shift. Um, permanent is, is just that permanent. Um, but the thing that might happen when it's temporary is we might have some ringing or some buzzing or other types of sounds that, that um, are present when we've been overexposed, that's our body saying, yeah, that that's too loud, too much. And, uh, you know, hopefully that that's, you know, subsides. Um, excuse me, the, um, the, you know, I, I think of, of, of people that go to concerts and, and think, wow, that was that was really loud. That was really something and my ears are still ringing. Yeah, that, that's problematic. Um, and uh, we have to just be aware of that. And then, you know, tinnitus or tinnitus, both both uh, uh, pronunciations are, are, are valid. Um, that's that noise, you know, that's internally generated. Um, uh, it, it's the sound that we hear internally ringing in the ears. Um, it's different for everybody. It could be a roar, it could be a pitch. Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a hiss. And I've gotten used to it. I only hear it when my head hits the pillow at night. Um, but, but initially, it was it was quite loud. But uh, interestingly, you know, uh, tinnitus can have um, other other um, uh, challenges. Other causes um, can be brought on by um, excess salt. Can be brought on by aspirin. Um, I was prescribed aspirin uh, when I first had this hearing issue because of the pain, and uh, it made it worse. Um, wow. Later to find out that this this is this this is definitely an issue. Did if you say you, Did you say excess salt? Potentially excess salt. Yes. I yeah. About okay. That. Yeah. Wow. Um, uh, I know uh, some some researchers talk about uh, you know high yeast content. You know bread. Certain breads might might trigger it. Uh, even yeasty beers, you know, will trigger that, you know, uh, uh, in some people. Um, but we're we're really concerned about that uh, that hearing, 
and then <clears throat> there's been a, a, a few research studies uh, in the past, and, and this alliance with what we found too, that uh, you know uh, Zeigler, and I think this this study was um, at a university. Um, college music majors experience tinnitus more than, than students with other majors and uh, all musicians, uh, percussionists and vocalists, believe it or not, experiencing the most difficulty with tinnitus. And then um, nobody was using hearing protection. And that's that's been something that, uh, you know, that we've been striving for. And it, it's, you know, but there are other approaches, of course, um, you know, that we'll, we'll certainly get to. But just being aware that, that hearing loss is, is potential in our profession mm -hmm. um, and, and that, that could impact the career. Um, I have a musical example and, um, you know, I'll just play a little bit and then I'll interject while it's going on um, to, to just hear how this, this, these sounds might uh, change as a result of hearing loss. So here we go. Okay, so pretty pretty much normal hearing. You can hear the right cymbal, you can hear the bass. Wish I could hear a little more hi-hat, but that's okay. And then, you know, if we make any kind of changes uh, just by using, you know, the equalizer in this, this app, um, we can kind of simulate a, a 12 decibel loss, which will be coming up here. And you can hear 4,000 hertz, 12 decibel lots. Um, and we start to not hear the clarity that perhaps we heard before, especially in the right cymbal. Uh, yep. Bass becomes boomier. Um, and then one other example. Someone with uh, severe hearing loss. be affected across the range even more you know and then we, we start to sound like an am radio really yeah that old uh, old old quality you know when we go back to that uh, normal hearing that perhaps we're, we're used to you know, kind of setting that's my own here wow, it becomes what a really apparent what a yeah, difference total total difference um so you know, one of the one of the challenges too is that, uh, just you know, in my own family, um, uh, when I'm when I'm listening to music in the car or whatever, uh, they would make comments like, "Oh wow, you're, you're you're we can really hear those symbols." You know, it's because I would always turn the highs up really high. You know, I will always crank them up because I I just can't hear up there as well as I used to be able to, um, and that was a that was a sign. Yep. Uh, for me as well. So just a couple of things, you know, we, we generally know what sound pressure is. Um, um, the, the, the takeaway from here is that um, it's it's on a logarithmic amplitude scale. So basically, um, uh, when we increase a certain uh, number of decibels, the sound power is doubling. And you'll see that in the chart in a second. So um, Typical values, 60, 60 to 70 decibels, normal conversation, loud concert, really loud concert, 110 decibels, or if you're sitting at the end of a runway, airport runway, 150 decibels, easy. Um, so when we measure sound pressure, um, we, we usually use A weighting, um, which more resembles the sensitivity of the human ear. Um, and that's important because, you know, when we when we do take those measurements, they need to be accurate. So we already know our, our concerns. We could potentially be exposed. Um, that regular exposure may may lead to per permanent hearing damage, um, may impact your career. A um, couple of examples. Um, this is a, a, a state music ed conference, and we actually um, uh, tested the hearing of, of music teachers at this conference. Wow, um, interesting. 36, yeah, 68% of the subjects, and it was a small sample, but 68% of the subjects had that audiometric notch. 
um, you know, uh, and there was a pretty good cross section. Um, you know, 24%, we, we generally will lose our hearing over time, naturally. So 24% had uh, hearing loss due to age. Um, and then 4% had no hearing uh, loss at all or slight losses. And that's what this looks like. Um, if you look at the left column, uh, we're really talking about uh, the band band directors, or some people did jazz only, 32 of them um, had noise induced hearing loss uh, or had hearing loss, uh, uh, 11 of them in both ears, 14 of them in one ear. Mm -hmm. um, some of the choir directors, same thing, orchestra uh, uh, directors, um, uh, general music teachers, etc. You know, so and it's a small sample, so we have to keep that in, in, in mind. Yeah. Um, spread it out over instruments. Uh, there were only four percussionists at this that did our study. All, both of, uh, all of them had, had uh, noise induced hearing loss. Um, brass players. Yep. Um, so, you know, it, it doesn't discriminate, but uh, we can certainly avoid it. And then looking at the, the, the scales. Um, the ones that are familiar are OSHA and uh, NIOSH is, is a governmental recommendation uh, that's equal to um, the American Council for Governmental uh, Industrial Hygienists. But anyway, NIOSH, <clears throat> if you look at the difference, exposure levels, NIOSH says, or sorry, um, uh, OSHA says um, eight hours of exposure at 90 decibels, you'll be safe. Um, NIOSH says, wait a minute, 90 decibels is too high. Let's let's set the standard eight hours at 85 decibels. And you said, um, con so what does that mean? I mean, conversation you said was 60 to 70? Conversation is 60 to 70. So <clears throat> as, as you can imagine, um, uh, many of the audiologists will say, well, we shouldn't be much above conversational. You know, and of course, when I've gone to these audiology conferences, I said, well, wait a minute, we, we musicians will never, you know, be able to exist in that environment. We have to be able to have a dynamic range that's expressive over, uh, you know, over the, the course of the music. And of course, done in appropriate settings um, and, and acoustics. So, Doug, um, and, but, and, look, and looking at this, it looks like you know, if most of our bands are in the 90 to 95 to hundred range, right. Yep. I mean, I mean, we try to get our bands not to play too loud, but there's times when they need to play loud. This is looking like two hours a day, max is yep. what they say. Is that's, safe. that's, that's our next slide. You know, it's, oh. it's, or less than that. Uh, but that's a great observation or less than that. When you look at NIOSH, um, but look at the difference here. Uh, NIOSH sets that scale at every three decibels. Mm -hmm. And OSHA says every five decibels. So basically, uh, at OSHA, every five decibels, that sound power level is doubling in their in their minds. And same with with NIOSH, as you go up to the scale, every three decibels, that sound power doubles. So that that's just an explanation. But Kyle, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, these are a couple of other studies showing the range. Uh, uh, Chris Chesky. Is probably the, the most prolific researcher of this in, in the country. He's a trumpet player. He's at North Texas. Uh, he runs uh, North Texas uh, Musicians Health uh, area. Um, he and Miriam Hennick measured their uh, his jazz or a jazz ensemble at North Texas, 98 to 100 decibels within. And then um, my my jazz ensemble in, I guess, uh, it's my second band when I was in college, uh, as, a, as a grad assistant, I measured those levels 94 to 105 decibels. Um, so is that to say uh, that you got your band to play softer than North Texas and louder than North Texas? Or is it just um, all in the it same is, range? It, it is. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> well, that's that's my concert band, first of all. And so, okay. so we also have to have to think about the room too. Yeah. Um, Can I ask a because, question? Oh, certainly. Um, when they say 94 to 105 decibels, is that yes. sustained sound or intermittent sound levels? That's a great question. Um, it could be a combination of both when you're looking at the, the, the meter. 
Um, and the, the device I was using allows you to separate out both instantaneous sound and sustained over time. And they're really looking at sustained over time as something that, that uh, well, they're looking at both measures, um, but, but uh, as you'll see in a minute, it, when you look at over time, you look at the potential impacts, uh, which is quite amazing. Um, other studies, uh, the big thing that, that has changed is that they make these uh, measurement devices called dosimeters that are portable now. And when I did these measurements, um, <clears throat> we put a microphone on, on the band director's shoulder close to their ear. Uh, the device is no bigger than a remote control. You put it in your pocket or on your belt and you walk around with it all day. And it just measures, measures, measures the whole day. So that's and, that's uh, called a. Can you go back to the slide? I'm sorry. Yep. That's that's called a cool. dosim, dosimeter. D O S I for people who aren't watching. Um, right. So D O S I and then the word meters. Where can you buy those and about how much are they? Well, the 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 thing is, you don't necessarily need to buy those, but if you wanted to, um, they are, uh, uh, you know, really um, uh, in scientific uh, uh, supply. Uh, facilities. Um, the one we use is about fifteen hundred bucks. Okay. So, so it's not something you you definitely would would have on your so own. This measures better, sound pressure, not not volume, which could translate in terms of volume when we think about that that perspective. So, there's a cheaper alternative uh, if we're getting our ratings, and it is on your cell phone. And okay. I'll show you okay. in one second. Uh, but to, to um, so just uh, looking at the potential here, this is the study I did um, at, at, uh, for my dissertation. We took uh, 10 different band directors, um, followed them around um, uh, for two days each. Um, that LEQ equals sound pressure levels. We received uh, ratings uh, levels between um, 86 to uh, 93 decibels. Um, with varying exposure times, you know, anywhere from from an hour and a half to four four and a half hours mm -hmm. of exposure time. But when you dig in a little bit and look at it by ensemble type, you start to see uh, some of the differences. Um, uh, concert bands were were okay to some extent, and then you also have to factor factor in the, the rooms and the amount of people in the room and the acoustic treatment of the room, all those things. So if you look at number nine under concert band, uh, an hour and 20 minutes of exposure, 96 decibels. That was a huge room, but they had built the band program to, to you know, a large size and uh, they overfilled the room and um, there were acoustical curtains that were there, but the, the, the and a high high ceiling as well. But the uh, the sound of the ensemble was just overwhelming. So did or, they have did they have the jazz band in a different room, or was it in the same room? Uh, in that case, the jazz band was in the same room. So I guess I so the question I was going to ask is why some directors their jazz band is bigger and some their concert band is bigger, and maybe that's just the size of the band. It's the size of the band or the size of the room. Okay. Um, because uh, look at number one. Uh, number one, uh, that that room was uh, um, so uh, a little explanation that the concert band uh, was in a recently renovated room, but in that renovation, uh, the uh, architects had created a side room for jazz because they they thought, well, what, it, what great it would be to be able to have a second room for jazz, but they basically created a box. <laughs> yeah, and with the same ceiling, but they they closed it in, and that's why the sound pressure uh, okay. levels are, are higher. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, and you, you just start to get that. The other piece is um, where the director's standing. Uh, you you might be standing uh, on a podium, or maybe wandering around a little bit with concert band, but with jazz, you're you're um, you're closer to the ensemble in in many cases. And if you're like I used to be. I used to stand right next to the ride symbol. I used to stand right by the drum set, rhythm section, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that's that's the, the potential of that left ear. Um, yeah, and then you could see that uh, for those of you viewing, you can see uh, jazz band director uh, exposures up into the 90s. Um, 
uh, and then here's that maximum uh, question that was uh, or uh, potential that, that Jeff was asking. You know, the, the that maximum could have been instantaneous level that that was achieved. The the maximums of 111 decibels, um, 115 decibels. You know, all in the hundreds. We we made sure that these events were not just somebody hitting a microphone. And you yeah. could tell when you see the printout uh, of, of the data from this device. Um, and then the minimums are just that that minimum air pressure moving or um, whatever minimum noises there are. But that that maximum uh, sound level was overwhelming. And, and, and even though it's not sustained, you did say earlier that even if it's a sudden noise, it can it can damage your hearing. Can cause damage. I mean, think about a a cymbal crash, you know, or a rim shot. Um, you know, the, those uh, instantaneous sounds that that might be impactful. Um, and then let's look at the long term uh, view as well. Um, you know, look at the uh, the 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 OSHA schedule for OSHA standard for a second. These are all the same band directors. OSHA is saying anywhere from 11% of exposure uh, of their full day exposure, eight hour exposure, uh, up to up to 37%. Well, NIOSH is saying, well, that first band director that had uh, three hours and 53 minutes of rehearsal is already exposed 250% or two and a half days uh, of exposure in, in three hours of, wow. of teaching. Yeah, yeah, two and a half so, days in one day. Uh, I have a question. So, because yep. we don't teach band every day, what if a teacher is not teaching on the weekends and they're teaching Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and they have two days of not, is there some sort of like, I can go over on this day if I'm not on that day, or is that a, an, an issue as well? Uh, honestly, I would say um, it could be an issue. Um, uh, what has been uh, documented time and time again is that there's no there's no necessarily, there's not necessarily a benefit from resting, uh, okay. from silence. Your ears don't recover. Like we say, those, those hearing uh, sensors don't, um, uh, don't regenerate. Um, yes, we want to have some downtime. Yes, we want to have silence um, and we should, um, but the studies so far is saying that, that there's, there's no regeneration over time. Okay. So, um, you know, and this 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 slide is just teasing that whole thing out. If you were to teach for eight full hours, this is where you'd be based on uh, those standards, six hundred percent. You know, for an eight-hour day of teaching at those levels for one for one band director. Yeah. Um, yeah, six hundred percent of a normal eight-hour dose. Yeah. So. Oh, sure, certainly. So. There, it's in the last. Oh. 25 years, we've introduced this thing called the Long Ranger and Dr. B. Oh, yes. Have you done any hearing studies about how that affects the hearings of the students that are hearing that, 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 that all the time? Um, I think that would be an excellent study. I have not. Okay. Um, but just when you said Long Ranger, I thought, oh, man, <laughs> that sound and Dr. B, you know, using yeah. the Long Ranger or any metronome, that... Um, that sound just came back in my brain and I thought, yeah, that impactful, almost snare drum like a metronomic, you know, and could could have an impact. It could have an impact. OK, uh, so um, I, so let's I guess let's keep going. Um, yeah. I wanted to I wanted to start talking about what we can do about it. I think we've seen pretty clearly. So con hearing con for conservation strategies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So let's so let's let's talk about that. Um, first of all, you know, just being aware of your environment. You know, you can look around your your room, your rehearsal room, and you can see that either there's no absorption materials, absorption materials, or that it's an echo chamber. Clap your hands together, and you might hear, you know, a reverberant, highly reverberant room. You might hear a flutter echo in some spaces. Um, you'll know whether, whether um, the, the room needs treating uh, just from that, just a, as a rough, rough guess. Um, and then you, you can use, you'll see uh, here in a little bit, but you can use your cell phone 
uh, to monitor your sound pressure levels, there are um, uh, sound pressure apps. Uh, there's one in particular that's very accurate. It's 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 um, uh, put out for free by NIOSH, and you can record the sound. And at the end, you can basically it's it's a mini decimeter. It does everything that that the decimeter did for me uh, 20 years ago, okay. and um, you know it's amazing. Just keep track of the exposure times. And I'm also going to throw in these things. Think about your rehearsal schedule, you know, in terms of your, or your, even your plan in terms of, all right, so I'm, I'm going to do this loud piece here for a while, and then I'm going to back off, maybe maybe do some sectional work or, um, you know, uh, rehearse a ballad or something that is, is uh, lower dynamics. And sometimes, you know, just adjust those dynamics and focus on, um areas that are that are appropriate for the room because our rooms aren't performance venues they they just they never will be yep. um you know adjusting those acoustical conditions I, I would say you know hiring that acoustician to come in take a look if you can possibly do it and it can make a difference then then it could be a good thing um not always possible is adjusting that ensemble size uh where i taught we were able to um, uh, we uh, ensembles met over lunch, so I was able to uh, adjust. Um, you know, when we, especially with chamber music, was able to switch in, switch out, um, and send kids to lunch at different times, so we didn't all have to be in the room at all times. Sometimes, and then the biggest thing is just being aware of your of the changes in your hearing. Um, you know, I I always thought that um, you know that that my marching band was the loudest impact. Uh, and I even wore hearing protection outside when we rehearsed. Um, but it turned out to be jazz and concert band and my, in that setting. Um, and, and, and just not, not ignoring the, uh, the, the tinnitus or any kind of threshold shift, any kind of change in your hearing. Sure. Um, you know, and then get your hearing che checked, you know, get a baseline hearing checked, check so you can know where you stand. Uh, and then monitor any changes over time. Um, you know, I, I have you, a question. So you, do you typically need to go to an ear, nose, throat doctor, and they will then refer you, or they have an audiologist there, or do you go straight to an audiologist? You can get you can get a referral to go straight to your audiologist. Okay. And many insurance policies will cover that that once a year that trip for for once a year. Okay. Um, you know, and and they're very comprehensive. Um, you know, you, you can, this next topic is, is, is somewhat challenging because as musicians, we don't necessarily want to put things in our ears, uh, earplugs in our ears, but you can, you can buy musicians earplugs that have some, uh, 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 some that are, that are molded, some that are custom and some that have remo removable filters, yep. <clears throat> excuse me. And then, uh, and they work okay. Um, I used them for years. Um, About how much are those? The, uh, these with that that custom, and this is years ago now. So at the time, probably ten years ago, they were running about a hundred, hundred and ten dollars. Are, are these the uh, ones that that you sent me when I asked if I were? This was like a year ago. I said if I were looking for something, what would you suggest? Is this those or what we're going to get to next? Yeah, this isn't those. Um, okay. And then the, these are the the non custom version. Okay. You know that that uh, might offer the twenty decibel reduction sound. You can you can use those as well. And then these. Um, I, I just so on the ones you just previously had. Yep. I I judge indoor marching percussion for in the mm -hmm. winter. I wear those all the time. Yep. I also have the molded ones, but I find when I'm playing, I can play with these, and feel very comfortable. Whereas the molded ones do give you that uncomfortable feeling in your ears when you're trying to play. Absolutely, totally agree. And um, the other thing that they do sometimes is, and it depends on that fit. I know a couple of audiologists that that strive, that work with musicians specifically, that strive to, for that good fit. But the other thing that happens with any earplug sometimes is that we hear that internal sound of our our articulation, and uh, you know, and that's 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 a challenge. You know, that yeah. occlusion effect, um, and that's. Very challenging. I mean, it's great for conducting, but when you're practicing, it it, it doesn't necessarily do it. Um, and then these, uh, and I don't don't necessarily want to, um, 
you know, uh, uh, push any particular company. There's a couple that make these that are adjustable, um, uh, automatically adjustable and uh, either battery powered or rechargeable. And uh, that's this is what I use now. And they are um, uh, they're not custom. They come with a bunch of fittings. This is what I sent you before, Kyle. Yep. And um, you know they automatically reduce the sound levels, either nine or fifteen decibels. Um, they kind of work in reverse of a of a hearing aid. Um, they're very sensitive. When I was playing in the Virginia Wind Symphony, I sat right in front of the snare drum, and um, I I put these in, you know, and they did the trick every time. Again, still a little challenging to play trumpet with them in, but um, you know, from the conducting standpoint, uh, I use them. I use them regularly. And those, if I remember correctly, they would run about a three hundred dollars. Uh, yeah, depending on the model, uh, two fifty to three hundred. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and yep. the the app you were talking about, which you have right there, I just downloaded it in about oh thirty seconds. That's great. Oh, however fast so you're your averaging Wi-Fi is. about 52.2 decibels. Yes, yes. And that's, I mean, it's just that information that you're you're reading right now is, is so helpful. You know, we get then a perspective of what's going on. And you can see from the readout, um, uh, Jeff, you know, you get the total run time, uh, you get instantaneous levels. So what's, what's going on immediately in terms of decibels? Um, you get the sound, uh, the, 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 the average sound pressure level, um, you get the maximum level, you get the peak level, so that in, instantaneous. TWA is time weighted average, so the average decibel over time, decibels over time, and then your noise dose based on the amount of time that you have um, spent listening. And that little play button is what you do to, uh, to, to start it, you know, and I use these in rehearsals now and it's it literally is just like the decimeter of of 20 years ago that I've done a, a few studies with. So, right. it, you know, for no cost at all, you can download that that NIOSH sound sound level meter. So that's that's really it, you know, it's it's uh, an awareness. I, I really do think so. You know, um, you may be able to do things uh, fairly inexpensively. Um, I rehearse my my jazz ensemble in a square uh, when we're sight reading, um, oftentimes, and I will tell them straight out. I said, "Look, we're facing each other. We need to bring the level down." Of course, I'm working with with college musicians, and and they can do that with with good technique. But um, I'm regularly in, informing them that that the, the room that we're in is is not um, not the performance hall. And even our performance hall is not the ideal size. So, um, uh, and the other thing is we, we share rooms, you know, of course, and we have some adjustable curtains, but they, they get adjusted by the orchestra director who wants more of a live room. I come in, I close the curtains and, and make those adjustments. So, um, you know, anytime you can, you can adjust your, your uh, time of exposure, that's great. Um, I now currently reduce my time to, well, I, I, I only teach twice a week. Uh, I teach my, my George Jazz Ensemble twice a week. And that's about what I think I can handle these days. I play bass guitar um, also, that volume is down. Um, uh, trumpet is usually, if I'm in a practice room, it's, it's usually with a mute in. If I'm in my office, um, I usually use a cup mute you know, or a practice mute. Yeah. Um, just to monitor, you know. Well, great, Doug. Thank you so much for uh, for spending the time with us. Um, Absolutely. It's just fascinating, you know. It's stuff we don't even think about. We always think about other people, you know. As a band director, you're always thinking about the students. I mean, you mentioned like smaller groups. You're like, what? Who would ever want to? See? You're always trying to get more kids, you know. Um, okay. Just the the whole thought of of uh, all of this is really appreciated. Um, I'm sure that your knowledge has affected many lives and will continue uh, in the future. Um, any last parting words? Well, thank you. Thank you, Kyle. You know, I will say that, um, you know, one, a, a quick web search will, will find, you know, of, of uh, noise induced hearing loss, music induced hearing loss, 
Um, hearing protection will will bring up a bunch of uh, research articles. Um, if you look up Chris Chesky, K R I S, uh, Chesky C H E S K Y, he's done a lot of studies at North Texas. Um, he's even put up uh, sound pressure meters uh, or, or in in rehearsal rooms so the conductors can know, you know, have a perspective of how loud it is while they're teaching. Um, you know, there's just a lot of strategies. Uh, you know, that we can experiment with, I, I would say that, and just being aware uh, of what's what's going on. And, and uh, if you have questions, you know, certainly involving, um, in, in involving professionals to come in and get assistance. And, uh, you know, as far as your own situations in your own schools, um, you know, let your administrators know that this, this is an issue just as much as um, you know, having properly set up a chemistry lab or sure. uh, pro properly set up a swimming pool or whatever, um, it, it is a, a potential safety issue. So, you know, awareness, awareness uh, over time. We'll all have uh, uh, sustainable hearing over time if, if we if we practice that. Well, Doug, thank you. Appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Thank You're you welcome. very much. Thanks for having me. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts.